sitting here at uh, Challenge Lab, and I'm to say welcome uh, to Challenge Lab from uh, uh, myself. I'm Anayas Hani, I'm the coordinator here at Challenge Lab. I've got uh, two of my colleagues here, John uh, Holmberg, introducing the lab in just uh, a little while, and Johan Larsson, who is working in the lab as well. We've got more colleagues as well, Gavin, who's not here, and uh, Christine as well. Uh, today, we're going to listen to five out of the eight master thesis that have been conducted here at the Challenge Lab during the spring. Tomorrow, we will listen to the, the final three uh, presentations. You've got uh, the schedule over here. I will. Uh, get back to it a bit later as well, and we will put the schedules and abstracts just around the corner. And uh, before I hand the word over to, uh, to John to introduce the lab, I would just like to thank Johanna Bay Science Park, which is uh, where we're located as well, because Johanna Bay Science Park is co-sponsoring uh, this uh, event with the coffee and, and tea that we're going to get uh, during the day as well. And we've also got help from uh, the organization Blended Learning here at uh, Chalmers, who is helping us with uh, the streaming activity. So uh, for those who want to watch this online, you can go on, log on to YouTube as well and have a look at these presentations. Uh, but uh, with having said that, I would like to hand the word over to John, founder of Challenge Lab. And uh, then... Uh, Okay, is there air in the room? Nope, it's getting <laughs> here somehow. Because it is, uh, you know, very uh, on the maximum now, according to Johanna by Sandbox. So I really hope it could work. I went and told them in the reception that they should turn it up, so hopefully. Yeah. So, I'm glad I'm first. <laughs> Still is air in the room. So, welcome everyone. Um, this is the uh, fifth year we have this event, actually. Uh, we started in Lindholm in Science Park, and uh, we have been here the last four years uh, at Johanna Bay Science Park. And uh, the reason for why we are at, you know, my, uh, at the science park is because we are in between academy and society. Uh, that is an uh, idea of being challenged at. I, mean, I, I will try to explain a little bit what it is all about, and uh, then you will find out during the presentation what it's really about. Uh, I will give you some introduction first, what uh, the background, actually, what this is, why we have it. And we can go all the way to the United Nations, to the United Nations uh, Agenda 2030, uh, which started at, um, uh, with a meeting in, in New York uh, September 2015, and never had so many uh, head of governments met at one place as at that time. And they agreed upon uh, Agenda 2030 with 17 Sustainable, sustainable development goals and uh, an agenda. And uh, what was very interesting in, in this uh, meeting here was that <clears throat> it was different. It was different compared to the millennium, millennium goals because the millennium goals was seven out of the eight was directed towards uh, the global south. 
only one is was directed toward the global north. But those are directed to all the whole world. We are also in the global north as a huge, huge uh, trans transition ahead of us. And uh, so that was one thing. And the other thing was that it was on the head of state uh, uh, level. The earlier work at the United Nations around sustainable development has been more linked to um, environment uh, ministry. So this was on the top level. And also it was a huge process involving not only uh, politicians, but also academy, business, NGOs, and so on. So it was a huge process and it was, um, and it has also spread since then a lot. We had follow-up meeting every year with high-level political forum in New York and a lot of activity in different countries. Some countries have actually linked their accounting system to the 17 sustainable development goals. Uh, what I really like with this agenda is what is to be read in the, in the, in the document because there you can find some very interesting keywords. One keyword is transition or transformation. Uh, another is um, integration, and the third is universality. And I will come back to that, what I mean with that, because it is easy to, that you just continue to work as you have it always done. Just linking your activity to the, to the goals, using them as a checklist. But if you really want to prepare for the future, you have to understand it is not enough. We have to do something else. So it's a little bit like comparing a shorter trip with an expedition adventure. So what we all do all the time, we are used to, and we use accounting, we, we use, uh, we try to optimize and refine what we do. In this uh, expedition, it's more about experimentation. And here, current structure, routines, budget frames provide a support while at that side, it can actually hinder the development if you really want to understand what, how you should meet the new uh, global challenges. It is, an, it is unexplored terrain or sea, and you have to test and you have to experiment into that. Here it's about goal, target, steering, control, measuring and following up. And here it's more about having, I just missed one thing, my glass, I recognize. Have someone else experienced that? Mm -hmm. what, what <laughs> <laughs> so, in, on the other side, this is about guiding principles, creating trust, autonomy, flexibility. It's about creating space for new initiatives, it's about reflection and learning, not least from mistakes. And here it's about putting the organization in the center, and leadership is very much about decision making. And here it's about putting the question in center. And then invite the relevant actors across different organizations to co-create around that question. And leadership is more about facilitation than decision making in that area. <laughs> and um, here we're used to problem solving and solution implementation. On the other side, it's about creating a desirable future. So it's, it's a different logic here than here. And that doesn't mean that this is wrong and that is right. right. It is that we have to do both at the same time. And sometimes and it is about mutual learning. And we have to create space here for doing that. But that cannot be done in isolation, in a satellite disconnected from this. So it has to be 
a mutual learning in this. And this is something that is quite, uh, some organizations are good at this and some are not. And what we are trying to prepare in this lab is good leadership skills in this area. So the students from Challenge Lab can really help organization to go into this logic. And there are no, not, and I have not seen so many um, out there giving good support in this area, actually. So this is needed. And the three keywords, transformation, it is about understanding that something old has to be replaced with something new. Sometimes it's not enough to just adjust what exists. We need a new transport system. It is, you know, to reduce carbon dioxide emission with 5 to 10% we can do within the existing system, but reducing it with 80-90%, we have to replace the old system with a new system. The same with energy system, and some part of the healthcare system also has to be replaced. And that calls for new logic in parallel to the old logic. And it's also called for integration. Integration means that we have to understand that we have to bring different perspectives um, there at the same time. We cannot start with climate issues in the transport sector and then bring in social aspects. Then it's too late. Then we have maybe big vehicles, very expensive, occupying the streets. Emission free, but not socially okay. We have to bring in the social aspect in the design phase. So we have to bring in different perspectives at once in the beginning. And that also means that we have to integrate in the way that we have to work together. Because no one can do this alone. We have to learn to learn together. And universality means that it's not enough to have a local solution. It has to be global possible, uh, possible globally. And in the in, uh, in United Nations, they, they mention it as leaving no one behind. So we have different spaces of creating this change. One is humanity, understanding what room of maneuver do we have globally? How do we, can we understand sustainability? And the students uh, sustain, uh, at Challenge Lab really understand this. And then we have to understand how can we work together? How can we co-create? What is the dialogue? How does it work? And the student really understand this. And how to bring in different perspectives. And then we need self-leadership because you are all part <coughs> of this transition. And that is something that the students at Challenge Lab have worked very hard. <coughs> Understanding themselves and how they can contribute to that. So, replacing an old with a new transition, transformation, means also that you have to realize that the current system is stuck in social technical system. We have existing knowledge in Volvo, they understand diesel engine. It's not easy for them to applaud the new electric engine coming. So it is a, resistance there. In the technology, of course, in the infrastructure, the gas station, in the market, laws and policies, cultural norms. Everything there is keeping it as it is. So you have to understand that it, can, it might be another factor that is dominating the resistance. And the future might look totally different when it comes to those factors. And here we have to start with an understanding of what, what do we really mean with sustainable future. And what we do in this lab is then using a backcasting process as a guiding process. Starting with the future and trying to understand what does actually sustainability means. And how can we ask ourselves questions around that? And how can we ask questions regarding sustainability? What, what, in whatever project we are entering. And when we have done that, we will try to understand what does it look like today? And what is the gap between what we have today and what is needed in the future or what is desirable in the future? 
Then when we have identified those gaps, we can try to identify leverage points that can bridge the gap. Leverage point is where you can put in a little force and have a big, huge outcome. And under identifying those leverage points to really bridge the gaps. And understanding that there are different factors that are relevant here. And the fourth <coughs> step is that to identify strategies for those leverage points. How can we work with them? Who is necessary? Which stakeholders are necessary to involve? And, and uh, how can we go about it? And integration is very much about co-creation. And understanding co-creation means that you really have to understand that trust is needed. If you don't have trust in the system, then you don't dare to make mistakes. You don't trust. You, you, um, uh, the collaboration will not work. And trust is built on understanding and active listening. To really try to understand. If you don't agree, even if you don't agree, you try to understand. And that creates trust and that drives creativity and engagement. What often happens, so it's very much about creating trust. And that is a uh, main thing in the challenge level. What often happens is that you do not listen carefully enough. You misunderstand and there is a lack of trust. And that means there will be a social separation. And if that is happening, the same thing will happen in different places. It will be redundancy in the system. And that will, of course, mean that it will be increased cost and decreased resources and internal competition. And if you have internal competition, you will have fear in the system. And fear will separate even more. So this is going in the wrong direction. And this is going in the right direction. It's about turning the system into this direction. And here we think students can be critical critical in creating that necessary trust. In the region, we have been working with trying to co uh, collaborate between academy and, and uh, business and, and the uh, governmental sector in different clusters to co-create new ideas in transport system, for example. And, and um, we we, we, we understood quite soon that it is not easy for new organizations to collaborate. There is a need for creating trust between actors. And here we realize that maybe students can actually be that glue between different stakeholders. Inviting them, listen to them, and uh, have dialogue with them in different leverage points bringing society, academy, and industry together. And at our university, students can also bring research, innovation, and education together. Because no one has the possibility, um, the potential, as student has, when it comes to creating trust, when it comes to, to, to get information. Because everyone, not being a student, have something written on, in the forehead. On my forehead, it is Chalmers. It works in business, it works in the governmental sector, but it doesn't work in Gothenburg University. Because then it's Chalmers. You are representing Chalmers. We don't really trust you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and that is the same even if you're a consultant or whatever you are. But if you are a student, the doors are open. People are willing to share information. And they will support you. And the, the, the shields go down. That means that students can actually be very important as persons in this transition. And I really think that is true. So therefore, we have this challenge lab. And the challenge lab is located here. And it is, first, we have a course called Leadership for Sustainability Transition, to preparing with all the tools and, and, and the theories. And then we have the whole, the whole spring is about this master thesis lab. 
And what is unique with the, uh, with the Challenge Lab is that uh, students are in charge, meaning that no one is telling the students what they should work with. But we support the student to find out. And that is very important because the students have the possibility to actually investigate a theme and map it up and have dialogues to identify what would be critical to do here. And they decide what to do. It, do. And then, sometimes quite late, they find a supervisor <laughs> <laughs> at Chalmers to guide them and support them in this work. And, and, um, and they also uh, um, plan the whole study themselves. So in that way, we can say that Chalmers, the Challenge Lab students actually do two master's, uh, master's theses in one. First, they prepare it and really identify the question, and then they work with the question. <coughs> so that is what we are doing here now. And what else are we doing? We're doing research on this, and we are building Challenge Lab now in South Africa and Germany because we have been asked to. And that is very interesting, actually, uh, to have different contexts. And what is interesting here also is that they are in the same time zone, so we can actually have some collaboration, maybe, later on. And we are also creating this space for change institute that can help uh, different organizations out there in society in these kind of processes, where maybe Challenge Lab students can be also active. And we are planning to invite students from Gothenburg University from other, uh, other backgrounds into the lab. Uh, and we are also want to assist other universities that want to do um, <coughs> similar things that we are doing. Did I miss something here? You want to come here? You covered it. So, uh, and we are very open for collaboration. So. If you want, just contact us if you want to have further collaboration or discussion with us. So, by that, over to the students, I think. Good. And the first presentation of the day is Pia and Kreshni. I'm going to get your presentation. Oh, they, uh, I missed this one. Our, our motto. <laughs> think big, start small, act up, and learn fast. So, thank you. What we're going to do now is that we're going to have the first presentation. You have 25 to 30 minutes to present your work. And then we're going to have 10 minutes of opposition, uh, which will be a discussion between the uh, opponents and you. And after that, we have space for uh, some 15 minutes of, of questions and discussion uh, where you, the audience, can ask questions. Uh, but I'll let you know when there's five minutes left. So after 25 minutes, I'll just do this one. And for the opposition, I'll give you two minutes. Two minutes. Cool. So, All right, I'll just begin. Sorry, sorry, wait. Who here in this room has seen one of these or received one of these? Yeah, just ex expected the majority of the, the the people in Sweden have received these. For my uh, non-Swedish speaking friends, or for those who have seen this the first time, please don't freak out when I tell you what this is, because I don't think that was the aim of it. Uh, this is a hand guide that has been delivered to every household in Sweden, and essentially it tells us uh, how to prepare in the event of a crisis or a war. And uh, one, of, one of many things that are highlighted in this is the uh, unsustainable uh, food system we have in Sweden that uh, with, with, in the event of a crisis, we would run out of food within two weeks. And um, it, was, it was actually a fun, funny coincidence that I received this <laughs> just a week before my presentation, because I actually also collected some articles during the time of our uh, research that also said the same, the same things, that we should start growing our own potato, because in the event of a war, this, the state can't uh, support us. Or uh, where do we new research is coming up that we should look at where we should get our food from when uh, in the event of a crisis. But then we have another hot statement that says, you know what, the food will actually run out within three days because we will run out of fuel before anything. 
And then this is my favorite uh, article, which is uh, that probably the biggest uh, threat is or uh, the crisis that we might uh, face is actually climate change. So what am I babbling about? Uh, I'm actually talking about can we uh, change the current food system in Sweden? Can we make it more sustainable whilst we uh, fight climate change? Without further ado, I want to present to you today's first topic, which is urban agriculture for a sustainable future. And uh, my name is Kershne Grama. I study sustainable energy systems. So in the one sense, food is energy for people. So it fits very well with my program. And I'm Pia Damsten, and my background is from biotech. So it's an interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, we're, 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 I'm very grateful for that. And yeah, let's, let's just begin. Uh, today's presentation is, I like, I like telling a story. So today's presentation is more a story than an, anything else. Essentially, I think the truth is, it's a story about two students who have run out of space in their own apartment uh, with plants. Uh, so now we're like, <laughs> we, we need more space for, for plants. And uh, we, we try to engage uh, the, the, uh, the community <laughs> to give us that. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, we're just going to take, take you through the whole process of uh, how uh, we came to, to the research question, how we um, engaged different people in our community and the uh, recommendations we came up with together. And yes, yeah. I will leave over to you. So Kreshnik had such a funny beginning, but now we will get serious. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as John mentioned, the thesis at Challenge Lab was divided into two phases, called uh, phase one and phase two. And the aim of the phase one was to define the research question based on a challenge in the region that we want to approach. And then in the phase two, we went out to answer the research questions through literature research, through, through interviews, workshops. And in parallel with this, uh, I made a case study about the potential symbiosis between uh, urban aquaponic farmers and the healthcare. Uh, so now we will start with phase one and tell you what happened. And as John already mentioned, we used a backcasting methodology to define our research questions. And this meant that we started with the future and uh, defining principles that should apply in a sustainable future. And this we did all together with the students at Challenge Lab. And this way we did not want to limit ourselves to what we knew today or to what society looked today. But we wanted to think big and define the future first. And after we had defined principles for the future, we moved on to analyzing the present system and at this point we invited actors from the city and had uh, dialogue sessions with them and tried to figure out what are the challenges in Gothenburg today and what is the gap between the present and the future and then based on our current uh, our common interest in uh, in growing and in plants we defined our research questions as uh, As, uh, one more time. One more time. Yes. How can urban agriculture be enhanced in Gothenburg and thus contribute towards sustainable development? So we wanted to see that if we enhance urban agriculture, can we in that way create a more sustainable city and in which way can it contribute to sustainability in Gothenburg? So to explain for those who are not familiar with urban agriculture, it can be many things. Maybe many know about the community gardens where you have your own lot and you grow vegetables together in some spot in the city. But it can also be like this, growing on the pier at Tissingen, where Kai Jordingen has established a commercial urban agriculture farm. Or it can be growing on rooftops, or in the middle of a street, or on your backyard. But it can also be using residual heat from a, from a building to make a greenhouse on top of the earth roof. Um, so there is many ways of doing urban agriculture, but in common, it, the common thing is that you grow food in the city. So now we move on to our phase two, and we start off with explaining our background research. Yes, and um, for those who are not familiar with this figure, this is the 
pillars for sustainable development, uh, which is something we worked very closely with in, during the challenge lab, which uh, there's ecological sustainability, social and economic sustainability, and they all build up well-being for the people or the citizens in the community. Uh, so we did a, b a literature review to see what has been uh, studied on urban agriculture, what benefits have been, uh, uh, what, what, what uh, benefits have been uh, analyzed and uh, brought up in previous literature, and we split it up into the different categories. So if we begin with the first one, um, for the ecological perspective, it contributes to biodiversity. So more plants <coughs> means more life uh, in the city. We, uh, for example, more bees is one uh, thing that I have worked very closely with uh, uh, lately. Um, but then we have it provides important ecosystem services, and this is very interesting because um, if we look what happened just a couple of years ago, 2011 in Copenhagen, they had a big cloudburst and it started raining a lot and it flooded almost the whole city center of Copenhagen, and uh, it caused damage for like I think it was seven billion US dollars, so it was a very ex expensive uh, event. And that was because they didn't have any waste, uh, any uh, water management. But, for example, when growing, uh, when having vegetation in the city, you can actually become or get free services in form of uh, water treatment and uh, like slowing down the water runoff rate and so. Uh, but it also cleans the air. So, for all, I guess most of you are already familiar with basic biology but that plants have a country uh, or a, the effect that it can clean uh, the air it can remove uh, carbon dioxide uh, nitro nitrogen oxide sulfate oxide and uh, particulates that uh, are can be uh, uh, damaging for our health and then we have uh, fresher food. So if we grow our own food, we will have fresher food, which means less uh, packaging, less transportation. And if we if we can get food straight from our uh, uh, soil and put it in our refrigerator, it will last much longer, which means reduced food waste. And then we have the economic, which is also a very interesting aspect. If we have uh, greenhouses on roofs, uh, we can actually reduce the energy demand on buildings because of the extra layer of isolation mm -hmm. and this can this can be very essential for uh, future investments of uh, urban agriculture but it also have many other positive uh, effects on the economy especially the local economy because it, it, it uh, attracts tourism which is seen already in very high rate in New York City and Vancouver but also in Gothenburg nowadays they have this uh, th event called uh, urban farming safari so if you google that you will find the details about that and you they will take you around Gothenburg and show you what's going on. It will contribute to the local economy and create jobs. I did this uh, inter uh, this uh, calculation example in the report where uh, we I came to the conclusion that um, if you would uh, grow on a surface uh, which is like the surface of a uh, Nordstone roof, uh, you could uh, have you could appoint two uh, farmers full time and contribute to the local economy uh, with a rate as high as 700,000 kroner uh, per year. So just from that small surface. And yeah, I think that's, yeah, the, the social. So the social aspect of urban agriculture is often highlighted in literature. And uh, it's mentioned that it creates meeting places in the city where people from different uh, um, different parts of the city and different uh, socioeconomical groups can meet. Um, and this way it also creates trust and safety in the neighborhoods. Uh, but also it, uh, it leads to an empowerment uh, and a social capital, which could be seen, for example, in, in London, where they used an empty, empty lot to establish a urban agriculture farm. And there they invited uh, school children and people from the enterprises working around, and also construction builders to, 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 to get a pet, together create this garden. And uh, this way, the uh, school children got an opportunity to get in contact with 
these enterprises that they would not otherwise have, the, have had contact with. And they said, the children said that in the future, they could maybe see themselves working at this business, whereas before they had, uh, uh, they had not seen that opportunity. Uh, so there's a potential to create cross-boundary meeting places between people. Um, and also the physical health is often highlighted when you are outside and growing. It's healthy for you and you uh, get an increased awareness about food, you maybe eat more healthier. But also the mental health uh, has seen to be improved when you live, for example, when you move to a greener area, it has been shown that your mental health improves. And also only if you for a few seconds are exposed to a green area, your stress level decreases. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and even in hospitals, it has been shown that uh, the hospital room that has a window towards a green park, the patients that are in that room, they will heal more quickly and also need less pain medication. So there is very a lot of uh, interesting research about the well-being benefits of, of green or of the nature. And uh, an interesting study showed that uh, in Sweden, 70% um, of the people, in term, if they have a personal life crisis, they will seek comfort from the nature and in other cultures you would maybe go to the church or to a re religious context but in Sweden people seek comfort, comfort from the nature so this is something to remember when we need to create the, the well-being in the city maybe provide nature in the city uh, and it, it is to be mentioned that uh, all types of urban agriculture won't contribute to all aspects of sustainability but uh, the potential of it contributing to several aspects is what makes it interesting to, uh, to establish in the city. So now I will uh, explain about the case study I did about urban symbiosis. So during the beginning, uh, we visited the aquaponic farm in Gamlestan. And an aquaponic farm is a system where you grow fish and vegetables in a circular, in a closed loop. And in this aquaponic farm, uh, we met uh, the tilapia, Oreo chromis niloticus, which is a fish that is grown in the farm for its meat. And during our visit, it was mentioned to us that uh, this fish has potentially a medical value. So based on my background in biomedicine, I went home and I started Googling about this fish. And quite soon, I came across news articles about that the skin from the fish has been used in Brazil to treat burn wounds on burn victims. So I started reading about to understand if this was what was happening and if this was a good idea. I went on reading about the research behind, uh, behind this treatment. And uh, I will try to explain to you very briefly in a comprehensible way. And uh, I will start by explaining shortly about the skin. And so the skin constitutes of uh, two layers. The outermost layer is the epidermis, and under that is the dermis, which is a thicker layer. And when you have a burn injury, if it's, uh, if it's not a severe injury, you will only damage the epidermis, and the skin can heal by itself. But if it's a more deeper injury, it can go down to the dermis, uh, either halfway down or then all the way down. And in that case, you will have a more severe wound that needs to be uh, treated in some way. Uh, and if it goes all the way down and, and destroys, if the injury destroys all of the dermis, the, you will need to transplant skin from another part of your body to cover the wound. Um, and in the case, if it's a very big injury, you don't have enough skin to transplant from one part of your body to the, other, to the wound. For example, if you have destroyed half of your skin, you can't take the other half and <laughs> maybe that would be strange. <laughs> so in the case of a severe burn injury, you would need to cover these wounds temporarily with something. And what you do in Sweden then is you cover them with skin donated from a, a dead person or from a, a donor. But in Brazil, they don't have these uh, skin banks where they can obtain the donated skin. So there they started experimenting with other types of skin, and they found out that uh, the tilapia skin worked well for covering these wounds temporarily. But um, there is still quite limited research about the mechanism behind this. 
and, and why it works. And there's not too many comparative studies comparing it with the current treatments in Sweden. So it's difficult to say if it's a, a good alternative here in Sweden. Um, but also, I can mention that I came across research where in China they had extracted the collagen, that is a substance found, for example, in the skin. And it's used very much within tissue engineering. And they had used this collagen to also treat wounds. And they had seen that it, they would heal more quickly from this also. And they thought it was due to some amino acid residues found in the collagen. So to conclude, there is uh, some interesting research about using tilapia skin within medicine. But uh, we would need more, more research in order to be able to say if it's uh, a good uh, idea to try to establish a symbiosis here in Gothenburg. So yeah, um, that, that is a very interesting potential of a symbiosis and we came across many of these. This was just one example which we found very interesting. Uh, but regardless, we could uh, soon come to the conclusion that urban agriculture has many, many benefits and, and a big potential in a city uh, such as Gothenburg. But what can two students do uh, to, to make uh, uh, impact? especially on a, such a short time during a, a half a year. Uh, but as Jon said, we're students, we don't have any label and we are uh, unbiased and everything. So we decided that uh, we're going to try to bring uh, the people to the table and we're going to talk. And we're going to fill these seats with uh, the right people and, uh, and then talk about how we can scale up uh, urban agriculture in the city. So. For identifying them, we worked with the triple helix uh, principle, which uh, just in short words, uh, if you want to achieve social and economic uh, uh, success, uh, the theory is that you should engage, you, have a, you should have close collaboration between uh, the academy, university, the businesses and the government, in this case, the municipality. So uh, we, we made sure that we had representations from all three sectors. We were very overwhelmed to find that the, there was such a huge support for this question, uh, especially from the government. We uh, had close contact with like the top names for each department, which I, I, I did personally not expect in the beginning. But this was very motivating for us to, to keep uh, going with the, the study. And uh, we, what we did was we had an interview we conducted a force field analysis, and also just short to explain what the force field analysis is, I did my own force field analysis, which is uh, that I should work out. So that's my current weight, and I want to move to this, this side weight. But I have like some uh, excuses like lack of time or unhealthy food at home. Uh, but I do have the desire to look good, and I have a gym membership. So, <laughs> so th this is this is sort of the principle of the force field analysis. So this was what we wanted to look at in uh, the context of Gothenburg. How can we change what Gothenburg looks like today, and uh, to a more green Gothenburg? And these are the results of uh, that study. And uh, you feel like taking over from here? Yeah. So the green arrows represent the, the statements people said for the drivers the, the needs to drive urban agriculture or develop it forward in, in Gothenburg and often mentioned things were that we need to have a green city and also that we need to make use of all the empty spaces in the city because currently Gothenburg is undergoing it's going to expand a lot and there's a lot of construction work coming up but meanwhile before they start there's a lot of em temporal, temporarily empty spaces that could be used for urban agriculture. Uh, and also the need to make a social city and to create meeting places uh, in order to fight this isolation of inhabitants was mentioned a lot. And also, as Krishnik mentioned in the beginning, the need to have uh, increased food security uh, was an often mentioned statement. And many people showed concerns about that because of the climate change, we might not be able to import food in the future in the same way. And then uh, we would uh, need to, to grow our food here in Sweden to a higher extent. And urban agriculture can be a way of preserving that skill of growing and making people interested in farming again. Well, when talking to 
the stakeholders and comment comments uh, that uh, or answers that were given was that well we don't have any space in the city the city is increasing it's getting densified we don't have any space and um, this is not prioritized in the urban planning we have bigger fishes to fry we have uh, smart uh, and energy efficient buildings and we want electric transportation and etc so th there's no space for the food question in the urban planning um, but what, two very interesting things we did realize very soon was there's actually a, very, a lack of knowledge. People, urban agriculture is a rather new and modern term, term and uh, there's very li limited information about successful cases. There's a, there's a lot of them and we came across a bunch of them which we will present uh, shortly. But um, we realized that these, these were the two things that we, we needed to start have people start talking and once they start talking they wouldn't stop talking uh, and uh, that, that was so the results of this force finances laid the foundation for the workshop and in the dialogues where they would talk and so yeah we can move on to the next one so and go to the workshop straight away yeah so after the interviews we invited all the stakeholders to a workshop and the aim with the workshop was to address some of the challenges found in the force field analysis so here you see the stakeholders that are working with two different questions. The first group was working with how to create space in the city for urban farming. And the second group was working with how could a local food strategy be implemented. And we started off with uh, letting them have a brainstorm session where they would brainstorm about why is this important, who should be involved and how could it be done. And this resulted in them creating two beautiful posters, which then laid the basis for the dialogue that followed, where we invited all the stakeholders together to discuss these two questions. Yeah, and uh, it, was, it was very overwhelming. I was very nervous uh, prior to the workshop. Nothing compared to what, what how nervous I, I was today. But uh, I was I was because it, essentially I felt that the, the thesis uh, result. Uh, was waiting on the outcome of the workshop and if the outcome wasn't as we had hoped then I don't know we would I wouldn't be being so keen on presenting uh, our findings but now we had a actually a very successful afternoon and we came to in total 12 recommendations which was split up into five categories and they look like this that we need to work in urban agriculture into longer projects. So there was an agreement that urban agriculture has a big potential that is currently underutilized in Gothenburg, and in order to uh, utilize it, it should be uh, integrated into longer projects. So um, that one, one, one way could be a local food strategy. And we need to identify key, key numbers, like maybe there should be uh, a food production per, uh, in, in every radius. Like we have Grön Uta factor in Sweden, like the access to green space, there should be access to local food production. Um, we should make it easier to establish urban agriculture projects in the city, something that is uh, currently very difficult because we don't have a system in order which says, here's, here's space in the city where somebody can grow. That communica communication doesn't exist, neither outwards to the citizens or within the boards. Like for example, Fastets Kontoret and Lokalnämnden could be collaborating and saying, hey, I have this enormous rooftop, should we do something with it? So that could be a, a one way. The development of a local food strategy is vital for reaching the environmental targets. So this is something we came across during the research and it's, it shows that um, if you have a local food strategy, you can uh, support not only urban agriculture, but you can su support a whole community development in something that I don't think we have ever seen before, and I will I will show you an example from Vancouver what that has has meant, but it will also help Gothenburg uh, reach many of the env uh, environmental goals and targets it has, like Olbara Moti, the circular city, Klarli Kjellvi Tre Dyn Kjutisvå Timmar, and more. Um, so it was actually very cool that we could uh, match the benefits of urban agriculture with ongoing goals and targets. But the main thing that made us, I guess, the most hopeful was that by the end of the uh, workshop, there was uh, this uh, big politician who said, you know what, I've heard everything and I'm very uh, optimistic and I'm 
completely sold on the idea. We need we need to talk, we need to uh, develop urban agriculture in the city, and we need to do it by beginning with establishing a new working group. So it w we were promised that uh, now very soon before the election there will be an establishment of a think tank where we will get invited, also the stakeholders that we were we have identified, and other officials. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Then uh, it's perfect because the last question we want to ask is: Is all this possible, or are we just like dreamers <laughs> who who haven't woken up yet? Uh, I don't think that's the case because during the period we came across very many interesting uh, top uh, real life projects, such as the Vancouver local food strategy uh, and the Paris culture. So this this is this is what was my favorite case. This is how P Paris has says, said that they're gonna increase uh, the amount of green space with 100 hectares. Now this is a very ambitious goal, but they they had uh, analyzed all the dead spaces in Paris and said that we have approximately 100 hectares, and these should be we should let project be established on this space, and one at least one third should go for food production. And I had a very interesting interview, and he gave me these numbers, which says that. Per year, they're they are producing from um, 20 hectares. They're going to produce 500 ton uh, of uh, products, and it's going to lead to like 8,000 liters of beers, 100 kilos of honey, and three tons of fish on uh, such a small space. And that that means we're only halfway through that 100 hectare target. And the next case, this is I know that we have some uh, relations to Berlin in this room. I know some people here love Berlin, so I brought this with me. Here's Berlin, uh, Prinzen's Garten 2010. This is Prinzen's Garten today. So this is a use of the uh, dead spaces in the city. And if, if you if you press the next one, this is how it looks inside. And it's what what oh, what's so wonderful with urban agriculture? It's so much more than just growing and producing food. It creates a community. And here they have a like bike repair or something so yeah it, it looks nice and uh, then we have the local food strategy which leads to a big farmers market four, four times a year and here's uh, a, a famous stadium in Vancouver prior to the new local far, uh, food strategy and afterwards and uh, then lastly we have uh, a project from London which is called Skip Garden which is also very relevant for Gothenburg because they just opened uh, something in Central Stakhonen, which uh, they actually talked to them on Monday when they just opened it that they had they received the they got their motivation from this particular project. Next one. And next one. So this is how you can make use of dead spaces in the city. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you very much. <coughs> Let's uh, start the opposition directly. Uh, the opponents, you get to uh, either stay there or if you want to uh, join on the stage, you get to introduce yourselves. Okay. So we are introduce ourselves. Maybe we should stand up. Okay. Uh, my name is Rin. Uh, or we're both from industrial design engineering from the beginning. And my name is Magdalena. Yeah, I'm representing Mark, so we're just here to enjoy it. <laughs> uh, and we want to start by thanking you so much for a super interesting presentation and a super interesting report. And we feel that with this thesis, you take a super strong stand for urban agriculture, and it really it really shines through in the text, and it catches you as a reader. Also, your interest, and you can really see that that you're really interested in this yeah. passion, which is yeah. You can also in the report you can feel like. So thank you for that. It made uh, <laughs> made it a really good read. Um, and just to clarify uh, something in the because in the beginning of the report, um, well you have super clear objectives uh, and you seem to use methodology and literature in a way that serves your purpose very good. Um, and. The kind of argument for carrying out the study um, seems to be based a bit on your opinions or 
you say, for instance, and, and we've heard in the presentation today that um, you argue that uh, urban agriculture isn't being taken advantage of sufficiently, and you sense that the benefits of UA are not comprehended enough in, in Gothenburg. And is, is this something that has been sort of a result of your studies, or did you see it beforehand as well? I think uh, when we did the literature research, we realized that urban agriculture can be implemented in so many contexts and in that way contribute to so many different aspects of sustainability. But as we see Gothenburg today, we realized it's uh, quite limited today how it's implemented. Mm -hmm. And we thought that if we could enhance the practice, then uh, the full potential of its uh, sustainability aspects would be unraveled. Uh, but I understand your uh, and uh, just to add to that, uh, we have, have this information here. This, this is Gothenburg right now. It's just expanding and developing. And we we talk about a lot of things, but we, we rarely talk about like the, the green greening of the city and where the food should come from. So in, in one and that sense, was the result from our interviews when we talked to politicians. Mm -hmm. Like it's not mentioned. Yeah, and mm -hmm. the, it was also uh, confirmed during the yeah. analysis that it's limited knowledge about this. Yeah, okay, I think you have like a good basis, but uh, and that could be made clear in your talk because I think the basis is there, but yeah, yeah. can be formulated. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, you talk a lot about these uh, social benefits, and that you can really feel that it would make a big difference uh, in those. And then you include this uh, calculation example uh, on the economic side. So I guess it was maybe hard to find these kind of calculations uh, somewhere else. Do, do you think that it's uh, uh, like the economic uh, incentives are important for this to kind of break through in the region? That's a very good question. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Uh, we are, so one, one thing before beginning our project was that it's election year and I was like, what if we still do a good thesis but it won't uh, result amount to anything because it's election year and after September we'll have another set of politicians deciding. Uh, so uh, I, I went a step back, I took a step back and I just was thinking what speaks to both blocks of the, of the political spectrum. It's, it's economy, it's like it's uh, Kroner and uh, so in that, in that uh, way I felt it was very important to at least uh, try to establish some uh, hints that it, uh, it is an economically feasible uh, solution and it can also have a positive impact on the local economy. Hoping this will snap up by, by politicians, but I still hope that the main thing they will snap up is all the other benefits, because you can never guarantee such a thing. So that's also why it wasn't that highlighted. At least I tried not to highlight it that big. Uh, so if, if, if you felt that the, the report highlighted the economic benefits much higher than anything else, then please let me know. So no, no, it was, okay. it was more that I was wondering, because I guess that was, it was harder to find things about that. Yeah, yeah. But I was wondering, uh, like, how necessary about it. I, I think also it was mentioned during the interviews that in order to, like, uh, have the conversations about urban agriculture within, like, political context, it's good to have some key numbers or something to point that, like, it will be profitable, mm -hmm. like it won't be a huge cost for the society, yeah. or mm -hmm. like yeah. that brings funds to the conversation. Yeah. Is it possible, you think, to calculate kind of the potential value of a full-scale urban agriculture? Yeah, so the, the, the difficulties with such economic assessment is that uh, there are so many different techniques of uh, agriculture. You have indoor with artificial lightning, and that's one difficult calculation itself. What I chose in the report was a very basic example where I think the case was that we have a parking lot that is not used anymore. What happens if we place uh, beds on it and start growing on it? And um, uh, I, was, I was actually pretty satisfied with the calculations. And so, but one thing that I should mention was that uh, in this calculation, the, to the tomatoes were pretty expensive. And that, but this, this is actually a very important thing to bring up when talking about urban agriculture. It should never become a class uh, issue. It should never be limited to only one part of the community, but it should be open for everyone, which opens up other ideas or theories that 
maybe uh, urban agriculture needs incentives or support from the government to like subsidize or maybe remove the taxes for the farm, for the farmers and so so the the topic i mean we can i can babble on this for the whole day so i will stop myself now. <laughs> but maybe we can also mention like the like many benefits like the social and environmental benefits that's hard to like put a number on and mm -hmm. and even though like how do you calculate what is the benefit of a safe neighborhood like and how much did the urban agriculture contribute to that so that's a part of it. Um, we also had a question related to the case study, which was super interesting to read, by the way. Um, and uh, we were wondering a bit, like to your knowledge, how much focus within urban agriculture is being put on these like kind of secondary, perhaps, uh, possibilities? And are they considered or is focus mainly put on food fodder? Um, interesting question um i think like at least i know that like uh, food waste has been used as fertilizers mm -hmm. so those kind of symbiosis are considered but like within uh, healthcare oh actually i know that um, the use of urban agriculture within like um, like psychology and psychotherapy that has been considered and to use like gardening as a therapy but like this, uh, like a, as a medical device to use the, a fish product, I don't think that has been. Uh, and then uh, the recommendations that you come with, uh, we thought that they were very clear and like uh, something to act upon. Um, when you when you made them, do you think that it was uh, any voice missing uh, for these to become real or like? Or was it someone missing mm -hmm. in that uh, dialogue? I think we were maybe missing some researchers in that dialogue mm -hmm. because they did not have the opportunity to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we got two more minutes. Yeah, so we just have one question. Right. Uh, we we we're still we were happy to have all the researchers involved in the course analysis, but yeah, it maybe would have changed things if they also participated in the workshop. Mm -hmm. So the final question, <laughs> uh, like in your view, what kind of role could your, or do you wish that your thesis will play for the future work of the municipality? So how do you hope that they are going to use it? I hope that they will just be inspired and realize that this is a, a question that's also concerning the young people today and uh, to like uh, give attention to this trend or this interest in this, interest that we see in the society. Yeah, yeah and uh, we, we got very much uh, compliments from uh, uh, the official from the UF about who was actually developing a local food strategy, so, which was already decided prior to the thesis. And she was very grateful for our, for our thesis and the workshop and everything. She said it was so, uh, so, uh, it was it contributed so much to her work that um, she was gonna take all what she had. She, she was soaking all the information and put in the local food strategy. So that's the first step. And I really hope that this think tank will be established because I feel that me and Pia we just like scratched the surface. So we we have so much more to talk to these uh, city planners. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now we we got time uh, for uh, questions from the audience, uh, and uh, so uh, whoever would like to ask a question, uh, you're welcome to uh, to raise your hand. I'm uh, I'm here too. Um, we've got one question coming in here. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. It was really, really nice. Uh, and it's been really cool working with you and also hearing about what's happening with urban agriculture. Um, I had a, I, I really found your like post field analysis very interesting. And it's super nice to visualize like a really complicated topic, but see what are the forces. What was really interesting for me personally, also as a foreigner in Sweden, was that the potential of um, urban agriculture as a, 
uh, to develop communities at like a really high rating by everyone. So that was really heartening. But my question is like, there was also another concern on this side, which was limited space. And this, with so many parallel developments happening in, in Gothenburg, how how do you perceive the the space for urban agriculture? Do you think it, it can survive with like all the other stuff, like transportation and all the other sustainability needs that also exist simultaneously? And meanwhile, I can just mention that like it was interesting. Many people were saying that there's a limited space, but at the same time, very a lot of people were saying that oh, we have so much space, we just need to <laughs> locate it. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit controversial in that in that case. And also, like uh, Kirsten wants to show, you can implement it in like innovative ways in spaces that are not being used. That's what currently is happening in uh, in Jan Station and in Gothenburg is that uh, they are going to build Kulbeshvas. Uh, it's going to undergo a huge uh, change, and they put up um, sk uh, skips uh, in the area, which are easily moved as the as as building start building projects begin, which is happening in King's Cross right now. So I think all three pictures we have here are from different times. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, what is what is very cool with urban agriculture is very creative. You yeah. have very many op options on how to to tackle those issues. But thank you for the question. That was a good question. Okay. I see a question over there. Yeah. Okay. I but I don't really understand that. Because just like it could easily be integrated, so how is it the negative? Or the answer might yeah, be yeah, yeah, perfect. And I agree with you. Uh, green roofs could be part of a smart house. And so the thing is that since the, there is limited knowledge, the current city planners and the architects are not really looking into that. But they have begun. Uh, and I know that uh, after we were in Stockholm, we met some architects, and they have begun uh, realizing that you can actually use vegetation as a form of insulation in the houses. So, but the thing is, when we talk about city planning, we don't raise the issue about food. Where's the food? We have these super sustainable societies, but if we ask a simple question, where's the food coming from? Oh, yeah, Spain, Morocco, Brazil, it's like, uh, I don't know if that's the definition of sustainable society, so that's why I phrase it like that. Any more questions? If nobody you, else has a question. No, you, you can go. So I'm curious about, it's a more a social question. Um, or, who, who has, have you thought about um, who has access to these, like, um, uh, Kralga, the, what is it in English? The, the raised beds. Yeah, the raised beds and, and the, the roofs. I mean, it, it seems like you have been, you've been talking to companies who have started their urban uh, agriculture and that would people buy into the, would, are you responsible to buy your own raised beds and, and find a place, if you were to have it more on this, like filling up open areas, I mean, how, how would one actually uh, go about doing that? And is it like for an in, on an individual basis or would it be a, a growing area that anybody is able to go in and access the food? Because now it's still an issue of who has access to the food and, and, and is, it, is it still on an individual person's uh, getting um, something reward from it? Or is it an issue of growing, I mean, growing on an entire rooftop where everybody who lives in that building has the right to go up and to access that food. Because I think there's still people, there are different people in society who don't maybe need, don't have access to a lot of food or local food because it is expensive. But I see it, the way I see it, it's still the case because they're not gonna necessarily have access or can afford to buy this thing and to buy the fertilizer and everything that you're going to need. So have you have you taken up that issue of like right to access, or I don't know exactly how to define that. No, yeah, it's but interesting. Um, I mean, with right to access, we realize like you can, for example, not establish an urban farm in a park because a park has to be accessible to everyone, and you can't like 
trips up with all like why don't they put urban farms in a park so it is a problem to mm. see like should it be private or should it be a community or mm. should it be like the people living around and i think it can be like many of these different mm. considerations but i'm not sure what would be the best one i think what you're bringing up is a very interesting topic much like i said that food the food prices can lead to the dominant class mm -hmm. question that this was something we unfortunately realized pretty late in our research so this is nothing we have uh, specifically mm -hmm. addressed in the report but it's a very good thing to highlight uh, just to mention quick the period what i would like so much with the paris culture project was that the the municipality said that we have these spaces you can have these spaces we will administer all administrative administer mm -hmm. things like contract visas and so on and they, they could also get funded to start their projects yeah. so, and this is something we're already seeing in Gothenburg in uh, Stadsnära Odling where we have uh, a lot of uh, farmland around Gothenburg which can be leased to anybody I think at least as Martin explained it and that they have an incubator where they will help people so People have already started thinking about these things, and mm -hmm. but I wish maybe we had addressed it more explicitly in our work. I saw a question over here. Yeah, a little bit towards the same direction. All the projects that you showed were very socially engaged to a certain extent. Do you think there is a danger for privatization? So the companies who built their new building actually see, oh, maybe we just put a grow house on top with one kind of plant to actually make a profit from that? Um, that's so do you, think there's, yeah, do you think there's a potential danger for that? Yeah, or like mm -hmm. that, where the social aspect and probably biodiversity is mm -hmm. not that much. Yeah. yeah, we talked about, for example, like aquaponic farms where you grow like fish and uh, vegetables in, in a closed loop system. Those are not supported by the municipality because uh, they don't contribute to a social city or a greening of the city. But I don't think they have to maybe compete with each other. Like a seller, you won't. It won't be. You can't make use it to make a greener city anyway. So one of the conclusions we came to, but it's not uh, mentioned in the report, is that we will probably not be able to feed the whole city by just growing in the city. We need support from the farmland. And I, th I think this this does offer one uh, necessary resource for the people in the city that food is easily accessible and it's produced in high volume so everybody can access it. That would probably also put the prices down. And but then we also wish to see urban agriculture for social purposes that the one should not exclude the other. And they don't necessarily need to compete on the same surface because. A roof is pretty difficult to access, whereas a raised bed out in Kajen, uh, Frihamnen, is much more access easily accessible by people. Good. So I heard coffee is on its way. Good. Then we can have uh, one or maybe two more questions before uh, we break. Uh, we take our first coffee break for the day. Any. Uh, any final uh, final questions that might uh, pop up? Any comments from a supervisor perspective or? No, you're good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I see a question over there from you. One. We are at the challenge lab now, and it seems like you have challenge hunters throughout your thesis process, and you also mentioned a bit you challenge yourself by actually hosting this workshop and taking a little bit of risk, but. Can you elaborate a bit more about how you yourself have been challenged during the process of teaching? I think I have challenged myself a lot <laughs> just by like uh, approaching people, like the assistants, and, and bringing them together. And also, we went to Special Pain to go to Stockholm to the Central uh, Event in Stockholm, and uh, I would never. Never have done it by myself. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to stand on the stage, and there were like uh, bikes on us. And <laughs> so I think it was nice to get a chance to do it. But I, I as a as a thesis partner, I was so, I was very proud that that day because I knew that you weren't that excited on going there. But uh, I'm very grateful you did, and I think you did a very good job. And uh, 
uh, one of my, my main takeaway from this uh, uh, thesis is that uh, we as a student, we do possess a great power in the society. We, we can make a, a change. I wish maybe that this could I could have realized this much earlier in my career, not in, in, not in my last year in the, in the university. Uh, maybe I'll have to apply for some courses for next year so I can still call myself a student. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I just met so many good people, really inspiring people, and uh, it's been good friendship that I've developed. So I know it's, it's been a really nice thesis. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Good. And I would just uh, like to say thank you very much.